And we're back at Singularity Hub here at the Expo Hall at the Global Summit with a very, very special guest, Salim Ismail. Salim was the founding executive director of Singularity University, was here from day one, built most of our programs in the, in the early days. Uh, you also founded Brickhouse, which was Yahoo's incubator program here in San Francisco. Have done a whole bunch of other stuff, and today you're the chairman and a co-founder of EXO Works. Uh, Fast Track Institute and a whole bunch of other stuff and you're like traveling the world giving speeches to like the most important people on the planet pretty much so uh, uh, some of that is true some yes. of that is true <laughs> so um, you've been talking on stage here uh, quite a bit and you're actually going to be on stage again yeah um, what's the I, I'm curious like what is the the main message today like, so I think we understand that exponential technologies are disrupting us I get I get that I think the question is now how do you apply it and how do you kind of na manage that transition into the world? We are in a frickin' mess uh, as technology is a forcing function that is causing massive disruption in all of our institutions and all of our societal structures. And so we need to figure that out. And our existing leaders, our, my thesis is our existing leadership can't do it. They were too stuck in the, in the way they did things before. You, if you're in the leadership position in a big automotive company, it's because you've been doing things for 30 years in that particular way. Right. And you have deep insight into that world. And now we have autonomous cars coming, we have uh, uh, other mechanisms coming. You, none of your experience applies. And the same thing is happening in government. And so I'm thinking about, okay, uh, we can talk about how you change leaders, but we actually need to change all of our institutions. And so I'm focused today now on more on how do you update our institutions like education, uh, voting systems, uh, democracy is broken, I would even argue. And so how do we deal with that? Wow, no small undertaking. The, the title of the talk is, how do you fix civilization? So, and you actually did it. a TED talk about this, right? I did, I did. So how are we doing this? Because it's, it's a really, I mean, it's a tough thing to do, right? It's, it's one thing to say, hey, here's the recipe to become an exponential organization, yeah. which by the way, you've got an amazing, amazing book called Exponential Organizations. Uh, it's a bestseller book. Uh, recommended by top CEOs today. A lot of, uh, I heard. Seems to be required reading at Fortune 1000 right. board level. Right, inclusive of uh, some of the largest consulting firms which basically make this like total like required reading for everyone in the organization, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so I think it's one thing to do this on like a company level, right? Yes. And that's complex enough, but yeah. how do you do it in like more the societal level? So I'm do I've got kind of three buckets in my world right now. I've got ExoWorks, which runs 10-week sprints inside big companies to solve their immune system problem. Right? Mm -hmm. If you try disruptive innovation in a big company, the rest of the company attacks you because they're so architected to doing things the old way. So we've solved that problem. We find we run this 10-week process framework and we can move a, a leadership culture management thinking two and a half years ahead in 10 weeks. And the opportunity cost of that is huge. And so we've done that. We piloted it with Procter & Gamble a couple of years ago. We've done it now seven times, and we've got a company that does that. Then I've said, okay, let's take that and apply it to public sector. Because mm -hmm. in, in the public sector, our existing policies are the immune system, right? You try and update uh, transportation, the taxis fight you. you. Try and update education, the teachers' unions fight you. And so dealing with that is we've, we've kind of applied it at a city level. And so we've created something called the Fast Track Institute, which runs this and applies this at a city level. And the value proposition is we find we can solve a problem facing a city for about one-tenth the current cost. Uh, and so we've done it three times in Medellin in Colombia and we're just starting this week with the mayor of Miami on the future of transportation in Miami. Let me stay there for a second. Like the, I find cities really interesting because they're this like linchpin for change in my world, right? We had this, yeah. so there's a one trend like this for the first time ever in history, human history, we're living more, more in urban context than in, in rural context yeah. globally. And then cities become more powerful as, as in a in a weirdly weakening uh, federal context. Yeah, very right? clear. Yeah. So, where do you see that that future play out? So uh, we think that you know at a local level, if you look at the big cities like São Paulo, Mexico City, Tokyo, Shanghai, they're bigger and more complex than any country was a hundred years right. ago. Right. Right. So they're gaining in size and complexity. They have low access to resources of their own, and now we find the world is being run by these city states uh, rather than nation states. Um, the whole Brexit, Trump, et cetera, all of that is not a left versus right issue. It's a rural versus urban issue. That's the voting lines there. And so as we look at that, Benning Garrett, one of our fellow faculty here uh, who works for the Atlantic Council, made a really profound comment to me. He goes, you guys are interested in solving grand challenges. If you solve grand challenges in cities, then you solve the grand challenge. Hmm. If you don't solve them in cities, you don't solve them. And that really hit me. Uh, and then Paul Sappho talks a lot about the 
the rise of the city-state and the, the de-emphasis of the nation-state. And so we operate at city level because we can get things done, right? right? Nothing happens at the federal level now for a decade or two, certainly not in the U.S., and certainly not in Europe. Uh, and so we need to operate and we need to act fast, and so we're operating at city level. How do you think the, the tension between like the city level becoming more powerful, the yeah. federal level probably weakening in power, but currently exerting a lot of like weird They're holding, so I, I'm, I'm Canadian. Right. You have federal, provincial, or state, and then yep. city. The provinces can uh, veto funding down to the city level. So they're basically holding the cities hostage. Wow. So right now you have to pay homage to that, et cetera. But it's like, when you think about um, middle management, is always the stressor in, in big companies. Mm. We need less and less of it today. Right. In the same way we need less intermediary levels of government and they won't go quietly into the night. And so we see massive tension globally around it. And this is the challenge. You can't change that system easily. It's a log jam. Yeah. So you have to re-architect it from the bottom up. And so that's what we're looking to do. That's amazing. Um, is there anything that scares you today in terms of like yeah. the, the technology, the change we're seeing? So the technology does not scare me okay. because we've seen, uh, I have a great little anecdote um, from eBay. You know, uh, you, you know, there's an interesting question about, we worry about technology because people might do bad things with them. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, if you look at eBay or Craigslist, you can just as easily do good things or bad things. Mm -hmm. I can just as easily mask my email address, pretend to uh, send yep. you a MacBook, sure. uh, collect the money, and then vanish. Um, and so you have these, several of these open systems where people can go do good or bad. So anthropologists and sociologists have looked at these systems. Said, okay, what's the actual ratio? Right, but good with that. Well, it turns out it's something like 10,000 to one. So there's 10,000 positive transactions on yep. eBay, same with Craigslist, to every negative one. Yep. So if that's the case, something like drones, our first instinct is just ban the drones right. and then slowly open that tap. What we should be saying is let anybody do whatever the hell they want. Minnesota ice fishermen, go to town. You know, drones to plant trees, go to town. And then police the negative use cases as they surface. So the, the, we're taking way too long to take the advan advantage of what technology is right. offering today in all of our institutions. And well, that stressing point is what we're seeing globally. That's interesting. I was at eBay in the early days and I remember like we had these like um, company beliefs, rallies and beliefs, right? We had these little like on the back of our batch that were the, the printed and the first one is we believe people are basically good. Yeah. And the basically is actually an important part, right? Because we don't, we're not naive. Yeah. We don't think people are all good but we believe that their, their, their first and foremost intention is good. And we see that in the data, and this is where Peter and Stephen identify this in abundance, right. where your amygdala is, is clock looking for bad news, and you're 10 times more likely to listen to bad news than good news, right? right? This is why Fox News does very well. How um, do you deal, though, with some of the new technologies have so much more destructive, potential destructive power, yeah. right? So it's like, it's one thing to like have a gun in your hand and be able to like, you know, fire eight bullets. Yeah. I think there's a whole different game if you're like engineering a deadly virus or something, right? Yeah, so uh, certainly the amplitude is increasing, right? right. So uh, the way I entered SU was that I did give a talk at NASA uh, just before uh, the founding conference where I said the, the damage that one person can do with technology is growing exponentially. Our ability to limit information from that person is dropping exponentially. That's not a great place right. for the crop. So that's kind of that's how they got. They, they said, "Hey, come to the founding conference, uh, etc." And then Peter said, "Do you want to run it?" There you go. Here I am. Um, uh, uh, I, eight years in, nine years in now, mm -hmm. I'm actually profoundly more optimistic than I was mm -hmm. then. Way more optimistic so because of that. Was the... Because of that comment that people fundamentally do good things, gotcha. and because the uh, upside potential of these new technologies is so profound. Yeah. that we have awesome possibilities ahead, right? Uh, the abundance that we'll see in solar and in water and in healthcare and in education, this is going to be unbelievable what happens in this next 10, 20 years. But our existing leadership fundamentally don't get it. And that's a problem. So do you think there's hope for educating those? Like taking no. on with, wow, <laughs> okay. No, you cannot. It's like teaching an old dog new tricks. They're too stuck in their old patterns. What you have to do is actually create new leaders. So it's a bit like the French Revolution? Yeah, you actually totally need to, but you know, it doesn't need to be violent. Yeah, no, I you, understand. At the very least, we have generational change, yeah. right? But you look at somebody like Vitalik Buterin, right? This, this is a guy re-architecting the world from the bottom up using completely new technologies. And if you're a 50-year-old a banker uh, at the World Bank, you cannot get your head around what's new. Mm. I think there's some bylaw, yeah. by the way, that says you have to be under 25 to deal with the blockchain. <laughs> it's written in some so code true. somewhere, yeah, yeah, for right? Sure. Like none of us freaking get it. We yeah. can't even, can barely spell it. So 
uh, as we see this new world order, I think what we should be doing is finding those people yeah. and just turn the goddamn world over to them. I mean, they'll figure it out. Right. And most of the time, we're the problem. Right. And we're the we're kind of stuck. We go, well, that's dangerous. That's careful. The world is too different today to deal with it. It's fascinating to see some big companies, Fortune 500, now have very, very young people in in very strong positions working directly with the CEO exactly for yes. that reason, right? Because yes. the CEO is like, you know, 50 plus and says like, I don't know. Yeah, like I barely right. know how to use my phone, right? That's right. Going back to eBay, I love the story about uh, the CEO realizing in 2011, 2012 that the, the company was in deep trouble, hiring the young kid and saying, go to Australia, right. uh, go, for, go off to the edge, come back and then we'll implement whatever you do. And the, to think about the courage that that takes, and their market cap went up $50 billion in six months. Yeah. That's an amazing story. And we see more and more of that. We, we, but we need to see a thousand times more, not like a, a little story here or there. In terms of technology, so you, you have a, an incredibly broad overview of like what's happening in the world. I've seen you speak many, many times and you know, we chat a lot. Um, is there a particular set or a particular technology, set of technologies or technologies which you get tr truly excited about in terms of like its uh, disruptive power? I think the three that hit me directly would be solar energy, uh -huh. because we will rapidly turn solar. Right. The poorest countries in the world are the sunniest countries in the world, so that's uh, well, solar is one of them. I think CRISPR and what's possible in biotech is another uh, unbelievable capability. We have one of our GSP-15 alumni that has a sequences a, a cancer tumor and then goes and sequences a normal cell and you can just clip out the difference in CRISPR. Mm -hmm. If he's correct, we'll be able to cure cancer in anybody in about two weeks for about $8,000. Right. That's kind of like a mind bug, yep. right? And so you see things like that, that becomes really powerful. And I think the third one would be the blockchain. Gotcha. Um, because we have finally, the internet's been an open communication protocol and we've tried with massive difficulty to secure transactions and right. have authentication. Yep. But now we have the authentication layer. And the possibilities of that are very, very profound. Yeah, it's really interesting. Like, as you know, I was at Mozilla back in the day, and um, uh, Brendan Eich, the guy who invented JavaScript yeah. and built the Firefox web browser, um, he and I always talked about like how we screwed up the web by not building transaction into the into the browser as yeah. a secure layer. Right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and Actually, I think when Tim Berners Lee designed it, he had he had a get and a put function. Yeah, right. We implemented the get. We didn't implement the put, and that's that's caused a lot of hassle. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me change tack for the last, like, I don't know, five minutes or so. Sure. Um, so you're doing an amazing, amazing talk, which is like legendary, which I think is not on your like typical like talk list, which is called the meaning of life. Okay. You did this at uh, our global solutions program, GSP, this year. And I think it ran for a record breaking 11, 11 hours. hours. Yeah. <laughs> so it started with like post dinner. Yeah, and 10 o'clock, uh, alcohol mandatory. Yep. Um, here's the thesis. You know, we have this, these blockchain, CRISPR, bi biotech, solar, it AI. It radically changes the notion of life itself. Mm -hmm. Like, why are we here? Uh, uh, what's the purpose of life? How do we, you know, Plato, Socrates asked this question, how should we conduct ourselves? Right? We don't have a clear answer for that. And this started in GSP9 where, where we had the students, they go through the first month, learn about their technologies, and their mind is blown. And they can't actually practically apply the thinking to the billion person problem because their mind is scattered asking these right. big questions. So we thought, okay, they're, they're like totally useless right now. Let's have this <laughs> session and at least give them a framing around this. Yeah. And so uh, uh, it's been some stuff I've been looking at for a long time. It's just an amalgamation of looking at Western philosophy versus Eastern philosophy. Uh, how to, you know, for example, we live in a world that's completely predicated on growth, progress, evolution, or improvement. Completely. Mm -hmm. We have almost no idea on what is the actual process by which growth happens. Mm. Right? So we, what we do in the session is analyze a little bit, lay a bit of background, then say, here's the steps, and then now let's apply it to life areas. Uh, and then we find, you get kind of instant wisdom when you do that. And it's all the way with a lively discussion. I throw up a diagram on the human condition, we discuss it for an hour, and then we throw up a diagram on truth, and we discuss it for an hour, and we go That's totally... Amazing. Uh, as long as anybody wants to go. The, the terrible promise I make is I'll be the last person to leave. Yes. Which is a really bad thing to <laughs> say with, with 25 year old For sure. um, uh, people that don't need sleep. Yeah, yeah, so what happened this year was I bumped into a bunch of our students, um, participants, um, probably at like nine o'clock or so. Yeah. And I was like, hey, how was the session with Salim? They were like, well, we just finished. <laughs> we're, just, we're now going to bed for like an hour or so. And yeah, it was, yes. it was pretty epic. 
And then I asked him the second question. I was like, so, okay, so you did the meaning of life. So what is the meaning of life? And the blank stares I got, and the only <laughs> answer I got was, I think the best answer I got was 42. Yes. Um, so what is the meaning of life? Well, I think the purpose of life is to grow. Uh -huh. and, and if you can understand, if you can kind of see that, like exponential, I've got a, I had a discussion with Ray, and I said, isn't all growth exponential? Mm. By definition, uh, you have these little S curves and everything that we do. Um, and he was like, oh, let me think about that. Um, and uh, we've got, we've got this kind of fundamental paradigm driving us. I'm fascinated by that. I'm fascinated by what is the nature and structure of reality. Mm. Like, in, for interestingly, as big as you want to go in the universe, or as small as you want to go, you have infinity in either direction. So really, if that's the case, then it's really just the process on how you're operating. And so if we can understand the process around some of this, and it basically breaks down into two things. There's either a dramatically uncertain growth process, and then we have a consolidation process. And we see this archetypally in everything you do. You study uh, a topic and then you take an exam, right? You uh, try and learn a driver's license, you take an exam. You have a sales and marketing, then you have accounting and fulfillment. And so we find the, uh, most life functions can bifurcate to one of those two. And it's useful to see that in play. You fall in love and then you get married, right? That's the consolidation. And so that, that kind of ratcheting, cyclical, fractal pattern is fairly archetypal in how we do things. So do you think that we are like... So that was that whole talk right there. So you don't need 11 hours. <laughs> I think the 11 hours version sounds pretty you, fun it, though. It's pretty fun. And you actually did one here, right? Um, I did it on the, uh, the first Monday, night, on yeah. the Sunday night. Because some of the alumni said, work. Uh, so I, I do it on demand and we do it now. I've probably done it 30 times. Yeah. And what's great is I learn something every single time. Right. So course. that's that's so fun. I think that's what I love most about this community is like, it's just such a privilege to be in the community because I yeah. learn all the time. It's like, I mean, I, I've had the privilege of leading the executive program for seven years. Right. So having heard, I've heard every single one of our speakers like 15, 20, 60, <laughs> totally. you know, autonomous car discussion, done it 60 times. <laughs> After hearing that discussion 60 times, I can pretend to speak about that. Yeah. I can pretend to speak about the blockchain. I, as my wife says, I can pretend to speak about anything now. So there right. we go. That's fantastic. Um, I'm curious, with all you're up to now, what is next for you? Like, what is the, where do you see Salim in like, you know, the, the I, I five to 10 years? I actually want to fix civilization. Huh. I, I think we need to re-architect it from the bottom up. Uh, what was exciting to me about when Peter said come and run Singularity was, uh, how often do you get to create an institution, a university? Like, that never happens, right? right? So how can you say no to that? So having gone through that process and now understanding, we've understood how do you solve the immune system problem in both private and public sectors, I'm thinking let's just go for broke because we need to fix the world and re-architect right. it and, and it's got to be done. And it's got to be done soon because, I mean, let me be really provocative. Uh, if you look at what's happening in the world today, you could argue that we have failed. Mm -hmm. If we had really educated the world's leadership, then you should not see Brexit, you should not see... Right the presidential race is the way sure. they're being run. And so we're moving too slowly, mm. right? It's great that we have 20,000 alumni, but we should have 200,000, 2 million right. out there. And so we need to really get our act together. And I think we're starting to get there. Uh, the new president in Argentina is an alumni, yeah. and uh, uh, Matt Hagman, who's one of our AP alumni, is now running for Congress. Right. And so we're starting to see really the, the model bite. But I think we need to re-architect the underlying institutions and create mechanisms for that. And that's what my talk will be about. Love it. With that being said, I actually don't want to keep you from doing the talk because I know I've there's gotta, a whole bunch of I've people sitting there. I've got to finish my slides. So. Yeah, right, exactly, in typical yeah. Salim style. One very last question. Sure. If people are interested in your work, um, the amazing things you're doing, where do they find that information? What is the best way for people um, to like sort, like get a, wrap their head around Salim? Look up uh, exo.works. My website is salimismail.com, and we have the Fast Track Institute. Perfect. And I've done two TED Talks. One is called Occupy Mail Street, and the other one is called Fixing Civilization. Perfect. So, two TED Talks, three websites. We put this into our show notes. Salim, it was an incredible honor and pleasure to great, have you here. Great, great to have you.